morning, everyone. Welcome to the January 25th Conservation and Natural Resources Advisory Council. We're happy to see some members uh, here in person, and we have uh, several on the line as well, and Gerilyn will be making those introductions. For those of you who are on the phone, my name is Gretchen Leslie. Uh, I am a senior advisor here at DCNR and been a liaison with Council, and we're happy that you have all joined us either in person or on the phone today. Um, so just a reminder that this is being recorded, so um, just know that uh, this uh, that little note at the bottom of the screen by participating in this meeting, you are agreeing or consenting to, to that recording. So um, uh, really happy for this to be the first meeting of the year and, and to hear the conversation. So uh, with that, I will turn it over to Gerilyn Singer. Okay. Thank you, Gretchen. And I'd like to welcome everyone here today, those of us in the Rachel Carson State Office Building and those of us who are attending virtually. Um, unfortunately, the weather is not cooperating with us today, although in Harrisburg it's getting very dark, but we don't have anything happening yet. But stay tuned. I think, I think our time is coming in the next hour or so. Things will start acting up. Um, but as always, I want to thank council members for traveling and coming here today and sharing your time and those who are able to be with us virtually. Greatly appreciate your participation, your thoughts and insight as we move through our agenda today. Um, and also a thank you to DCNR staff and our audience members who have selected to join, join in with us today. Glad you're here. And I'm also very happy to have some familiar faces around our table today, <laughs> particularly Secretary Dunn and Gretchen. Um, very grateful that you all are back with us and a big welcome to you and, and appreciate you both being here and helping us out today. I'm grateful you said familiar, not old. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, familiar. Because <laughs> if I said old, I would be including myself too. <laughs> uh, today on our agenda, we will have an update from the Secretary on some recent accomplishments, a look ahead at DCNR's priorities and initiatives. Um, and then following that, we'll have our department report, our legislative report, and then today we have two presentations. Um, one is going to be with the Bureau of Forestry. We'll discuss their outreach with their service foresters working with forest landowners. Should be a great presentation to hear about today. And then second, um, we will also hear from DCNR's Next Gen Council and their efforts to provide new perspectives into the department's work. So with that, we'll get started with our council introductions. And one comment I just wanted to make is that some of the feedback we received from our virtual council members last time is that when we folks here around the table go to talk to please talk directly into the microphone, when we pull away from our seats or turn our heads, they, have, they lose us. So if you could just make a concerted effort to try to speak in your microphone, I think that will make it um, good for everybody on, on both ends. Um, so with that, today we are happy to welcome our newest council member, Marcus Schaffner. Marcus is from the Pittsburgh area and had all intentions of joining us in person today until we heard the weather forecast. <laughs> So he and Dave are out west holding down the fort out that way. But Marcus, we are so glad to have you join council and um, was wondering if you could share with us a little bit about yourself. Absolutely. Uh, thanks for the warm introduction. <laughs> uh, it's not as warm here in Pittsburgh, but we're, we're really hoping for <laughs> some warm weather here. So uh, pleasure to meet everyone. My name is Marcus. Uh, I am the president and CEO of the Outdoor Inclusion Coalition uh, and programmatically and, and coalition wise, what I focus on is attracting, uh, recruiting and sustaining underrepresented populations in the outdoor industry. And I kind of focus on that uh, above and beyond the recreational aspect, but really reshaping the industry to be uh, representative of the natural diversity that is in the state of Pennsylvania. So. Uh, we really focus on a lot of different things related to career opportunities, but uh, everyone having that access and sustainability to recreate in a fashion that seems fit for them. So I'm really excited to bring that to the table here. Uh, 
for the advisory council. I'm really looking forward to connecting with everyone in person in March. Uh, I promise I'll be there unless we, we get some more snow. So uh, looking forward to this meeting uh, and hope to connect with everyone very soon. Okay, great, Marcus. Thanks so much. And um, some of you may remember Marcus. He was he served on our very uh, as a panel member on our first Conrac conversations, um, the equity in the outdoors. So you may remember him from that. He also has recently joined the Recreation Engagement Coalition with Nathan Rigner and is part of that group, and is also. Uh, on the Pennsylvania Parks and Forestry Foundation with Marcy. So he is a face that we're going to be seeing and so glad that you're involved in many with many of the organizations that we are as well. So again, a big welcome to you. Um, also at this time, if I could start with our council members virtually to introduce themselves. Dave, can we start with you? All right, Dave may not be there at the moment. Dave uh, Trim. He's there, but he needs to unmute. Or I think you need to unmute, Dave. Okay. I, oh, there you are. I, yeah, I did that once, but it, apparently <laughs> I see it went back. Anyway, uh, yeah, I was really looking forward to uh, being there today, but unfortunately, I think it called me to stop of Warren, and it is snowing hard right now. Yeah. So yeah. anyhow, um, I've been uh, been on the council since I think 2014, and uh, again was looking forward to being there today, and glad to see uh, Secretary Dunn back and and uh, Gretchen back, and the rest of you. And hopefully next time around it'll be a little bit better. We hope so too. Thanks, Dave. Janet. Hi, welcome everyone. Janet Sweeney with the Pennsylvania Environmental Council. Sorry, um, could not be there in person today. Um, it hasn't started snowing here yet, but I'm waiting for it. But um, enjoy your day, everyone. Thanks. Thank you, Janet. Joanne. Good morning. Um, thank you so much for um, hosting this in this hybrid format. It's really helpful. I'm actually also calling in from Pittsburgh today. Um, and uh, really happy to be here. I'm Joanne Kilgower. I'm the uh, executive director of the Ohio River Valley Institute and um, am particularly excited about having representatives from the Next Gen Council here today. Um, so just wanted to extend a, another welcome to our uh, Next Gen Council guests. Thank you. Great. Greg? Uh, good morning, everyone. Greg Goldman from Philadelphia. Apologies for not being able to be there in person. Uh, congratulations again to Secretary Dunn for her reappointment. Very, very uh, exciting for everyone in the Commonwealth. And thank you for your willingness to serve and take this on uh, again uh, as well. I'm the former executive director of Audubon, Pennsylvania, and I'm currently on the faculty of the Urban Studies Program and the School of Social Policy and Practice at University of Pennsylvania. <clears throat> okay, thanks. So glad you're here as well. Okay, now if we can go around the table with our council members. Matt, would you start us off? Good morning. I'm Matt Gobbler. I'm the executive director of the Pennsylvania Forest Products Association. Glad to be here today. I am making note of the room's arrangement. I think we should uh, commission an artist to do like a Last Supper style painting. <laughs> that would work pretty well. Thanks. <laughs> Good morning. I'm uh, Bob Kirshner. I'm the uh, vice chair of council, and uh, I'd just like to echo what everyone else has said with regard to familiar faces and, and glad to be here. Uh, I'm from St. Mary's, and I may be the singular person who's looking forward to today's weather forecast as a dedicated snowmobiler. Nice. Good morning. My name is Rocco Ally. I've been with council for several years. Again, uh, Cindy and Gretchen, congratulations on your reappointments. Um, looking forward to continuing working with you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Gary Cribbs. Been on the council uh, quite a while. I'm uh, president of ENGO Science. And once again, congratulations getting reappointed. It's uh, going to be great working. 
Good morning. I'm Meredith Graham. I am an environmental attorney from the Pittsburgh area. I'm really looking forward to building on the momentum that we established in the last cycle and look, just looking forward to an energetic year. Thanks, Meredith. Glad you're here. And now if we can turn to our audience for just introductions in, in our audience. Hey, so glad you're here with us, Kat. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, and then our audience. Is this our audience list or okay. So I think we have about twenty five or so. Twenty five uh audience members joining us as well. So thank you from that end. All right, moving on our agenda here. It's also our first opportunity for public comment. And this comment at the beginning of our meeting is just for anyone that has any issues that they would like to share with us from the public. And I don't believe we have anyone signed up. Is that correct, Katrina? We have not had any requests. Okay, thank you. All right, well with that, we're gonna move on with our minutes. Council has received the minutes of the November 16th meeting, and I do have one addition um, in looking those over, and that is to add Silas Chamber Chamberlain under our members present. It was just an oversight. I think it was hard trying to do that virtually, but if we could add him to the members present, he was present in November. And noting my addition, do we have a motion to accept the November 16th minutes? So moved. Thank you, Rocco. A second? Second. Thank you, Gary. Any opposed? Okay, hearing none, our minutes are good. Thank you so much. And on to council report. And there's not too much to report today. I think as we wound down the end of last year at our November meeting, we were really our energy went into our preparation of our transition document that Meredith led us through as a team. And we have that, which I think is going to be a great piece that will serve us well as we look uh, later, possibly in our working session, to discuss priorities and where the council will be focusing for this calendar year. So we have that. And also with Secretary Dunn's presentation today, we'll take all of that information and start formulating our priorities and agenda for our calendar year. All right, and with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Secretary Dunn. Thank you. Well, thank you, and um, I can't tell how happy I am to be here and how uh, glad for that opportunity to serve. I was um, approaching the end of the Wolf Administration um, at, at an age, frankly, where I could start shopping for the RV and thinking about uh, travel. <laughs> and I thought, you know, I love this job and I love this work and uh, not quite ready to do that. And um, I was uh, honored when Governor-elect Shapiro, elect at the time, um, considered my application and interviewed me, had a, a really energetic conversation and uh, very forward-looking for DCNR's uh, mission and role in his new administration. So I was really uh, delighted and honored for the chance to serve. And, you know, I would say one of the, the real uh, pleasures of the service is uh, the connection with the stakeholders and citizens who support DCNR. A government, is, and as you all know, by virtue of you choosing to step forward, government can't be effective without, you know, active engagement with citizens and stakeholders. And uh, as Geraldine said, you were selected uh, because you bring a lot to the table. You represent a sector, you have deep engagement, involvement, you bring in uh, experience. And for DCNR's mission, you know, you're, you're a lens through uh, which we can see a, a bigger world and uh, we never wanna be that organization that's a closed uh, government entity in some building in Harrisburg that 
people don't feel connected to, that there'd be a formula for the, the you know, loss of the agency, be a formula for the loss of the things we care about. And since we have um, a, a deep responsibility, constitutional responsibility to the citizens of Pennsylvania, including generations yet to come, it's, it really behooves us to um, do, do this element of our work well, and that is uh, working with stakeholders and entities that support our mission, challenge our mission, work with us, set policy, et cetera. And Gretchen and I think, you know, council has just never been better. It gets better and better and better. And it, it really um, came its, you know, its best and is still getting better. So I just applaud your uh, dedication and um, the, uh, the professional approach you take uh, to your work. Because it, really it really does help us. You know, these uh, short meetings in Harrisburg every two months or a window. I mean, think about the, uh, you know, what you bring to the table. You think about the road miles, we'd have to get that knowledge and the time to get that knowledge if we didn't have these. So you, you bring a lot into us, so don't ever uh, underestimate uh, your value to us. Uh, Gerilyn uh, makes it even better when she brings like outrageously wonderful treats, <laughs> like the cake last fall, and now that now these are great bagels. So those of you on the phone are missing out. Uh, special welcome to Marcus uh, Schaffner. Marcus, uh, you're stepping up in so many ways. We really appreciate that. Uh, we're excited uh, for your engagement with us here in this entity as well, because it adds an, another dimension to your uh, your contribution. So we. We're excited. Um, I just want to mention my, you know, just looking backwards just for a minute, uh, my appreciation for the uh, work we are able to do with you and with your uh, guidance in the Wolf Administration. We got a lot done. We were um, at a very high level of uh, play right right up to the end, which is one of the reasons, frankly, I wanted to stay. There's so much exciting going on, but uh, with unprecedented financial support, and being able to launch three new state parks, making a Governor Wolf a governor that had launched four new state parks, uh, with our our beginning of our hiring a director of outdoor recreation, aiming toward an office of outdoor recreation, and really beginning a process of elevating outdoor recreation through engagement with all these uh, various parties, and internally and externally. And I think we've already we've already raised the. Uh, the value of outdoor recreation by virtue of the process that we've begun. Um, we, uh, we, we started on a shoestring and the legislature supported our riparian forest buffer work. We, uh, we started it by carving out some of the funds that we could and then uh, the legislature saw the value, uh, created the Keystone Tree Fund, and then in uh, June added funding to it. Uh, so now we're uh, forestry and the Bureau, and Bureau of Rec and Con are working together, um, moving a record amount of money to partners and landowners to get trees on the ground and the most, uh, the place they do the most good, and that's along stream side. So that's uh, was exciting and a big opportunity for us as well. And then our, our climate change and mitigation work continued um, to grow, even right up to the very end, uh, close to the end of the Wolf Administration, we made a commitment that our state park system, you know, now 124, would be net zero by 2030. So that um, implies, um, you know, more on-site solar, that implies more green energy purchase, um, energy conservation, uh, thoughtful design, et cetera. So uh, we have... Um, continuing to, to grow that work. So now looking ahead, uh, you know, in, in the conversations with uh, Governor Shapiro, he's very energized by our mission. When you think about um, his background as a county commissioner and what, what he accomplished there, one thing that stood out, uh, just, just knowing what they were doing in Montgomery County, when he and uh, Leslie Richards, uh, past uh, transportation secretary, were commissioners, they uh, were really serious about trails and trail connections. Uh, so Governor Shapiro is very interested in, in trails, and that's uh, something that we have queued up as um, a big advancement for our mission. Uh, and one way, one reason we're able to do this so well, the conservation landscape initiatives and the heritage programs have uh, you know, deep, rich partnerships on the ground that um, 
you know, help bring together and make sure these trail projects are elevated, um, you know, through the PennDOT's process, through DCD's process, through our process, and we're really well equipped um, up up there in the um, you know Pennsylvania wilds. I mean, Eric Coolidge, county commissioner from Tioga County, has been working for years to connect Wellsboro to the Pine Creek Rail Trail. Ex expensive, uh, you know, all these trails are, are are difficult. You know, they encounter, you know, trails are linear. They encounter a lot of obstacles. Uh, we're you know. You know, pound through the obstacles and, and get that thing done. Looking at the area of Pittsburgh Trail along, you know, along the Allegheny for part of its uh, course. Again, big obstacles, uh, big big projects in the way. But when you think about the, the impact of uh, completing that trail, it'd be remarkable. So, uh, I mean, Governor Shapiro understands the not only the recreation value but the economic value these big trails bring. So, um, I think we'll be able to make you know, a lot of progress in that in that realm. Um, one thing we had supplied to the uh, Shapiro transition team late fall uh, was a set of 13 white papers that, um, you, know, you know, Gretchen, Gretchen, when she's not leading CONRAC, is our strategic initiatives lead, and Gretchen led a process uh, through, through a staff retreat and then uh, white paper writing where we developed 13 white papers to guide the future of the agency, and we provided that to the transition team, and it covers issues. You know, that the Office of Outdoor Recreation, motorized recreation, Bob. You know, pulling a lot from uh, the, the work that we've done here with Council Pennsylvania Outdoor Corps, which I'll, I'll make a note to mention that infrastructure, ongoing challenges and opportunities on infrastructure, land conservation and stewardship, carbon capture and storage, uh, climate change broadly and then uh, you know natural gas development on state lands etc so we um, had done the work that will really be our starting um, you know agenda for this this administration we had done the strategic thinking of, of that so we'll be guided by uh, by that work uh, we've got a pretty full plate <laughs> going ahead um, I don't know which of those you want me to touch on on the carbon capture and storage um, our role is, number one, we had an internal agency work group of DCD, DEP, and us to be constantly looking at the science, the opportunity, et cetera. So when the question comes, uh, it'll come and there'll be answers needed, like can can the geology near this whatever, whether it's a manufacturing plant, uh, you know, some gas production facility, whatever, can it can the geology support carbon capture and where? That question will come, and it won't be able to wait for you know 20 years worth of research, right? So we um, are gearing up to have that information available. We have uh, a core, core storage. That'd be an interesting field trip for you if everyone see it. Our core storage right now in Middletown. We have a, 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 a Jason, we have another core storage out in the countryside too. It's a little more remote, but um, we needed a um, a, a larger. Um, organized way when when the questions come in faster and more furious like where where you need to see and scientists for government and scientists uh, you know for industry need to see the core spaces to really analyze what you know how much how much could this store we'll have the uh, core samples cataloged and available we do a good job of organizing them now but we need more space so that uh, we funded uh, we have funding uh, using our oil and gas fund for um, a new facility, and Lauren Imgrind and our bureau is looking for that place. Um, land conservation and stewardship, again, land conservation is a big part of our mission. We, uh, we look to uh, work with our 80 land trust partners from across the Commonwealth on land trust opportunities and priorities. They all have good prioritization tools. We have good prioritization tools and uh, continue to develop that opportunity. Um, our outdoor core every year it gets uh, better and better. Just as um, just as we have to plan long into the future for conservation and environment, um, we have to plan workforce ahead too. And that's why our next gen council. That's why outdoor core. We've got to have the set of uh, people committed to conservation and, and equipped with knowledge that can carry this work forward because again it's long-term work I mean 
Sally Jewell, who was the head of the Department of Interior, said it well. We're in the forever business. You, you've, you've got to play, you know, in forestry, you're, you're looking at forest, you know, 150 years out. In geology, you're, you're looking bigger time scales in, in our ecological and climate work. You know, we're looking at goals that are stated around the 2050. So we, um, we have to have the long-term vision, and it has to include the people and the workers uh, in, that, in that business. So that's, how the, that's, a, that's the look that we take going on that. I don't want to go on uh, too long. I mean, again, I'm excited uh, for the, you know, the time forward. I think a lot of our work will continue and grow, but I think we'll, we'll double down um, and focus on a, a few key areas with the, with the governor. Again, he had an announcement yesterday about really building a you know, opportunities for economic development in Pennsylvania. I think the big trails are going to be perhaps the fastest um, way in, in the outdoor rec sector that we can really, uh, you know, put the money on the ground and provide the opportunity for these small communities along the old rail lines. So I think that's it for me uh, right now, unless there are questions. All right. Are there any questions for the secretary? both virtually or here at our table. Nope. All right. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Appreciate it. I'll be here. I'll be here for part of the morning and then I have my confirmation meetings are are starting, so <laughs> I'll be here. Uh, be busy with I'll those. Be busy with <laughs> I actually enjoy the opportunity there too. Yeah. Um, great. Great. Great to have you here. All right. Well, thank you. And moving on, next we will have Gretchen uh, Leslie with our DCNR department report. Gretchen? Good morning again, everyone. Um, uh, thanks for joining us. Um, I won't put myself on camera here. You'll, uh, I'll try to adjust. We have a sophisticated camera system here. I'll just, I'll just say that. It's me, like, adjusting this little mini camera here. So you'll, I'll, I'll focus on our council members who... You can see their expressions on their faces while, while I'm talking. Um, <laughs> uh, so I always like to use this meeting as a reminder of our upcoming meetings. Uh, so if uh, those of you who are on the phone or who are guests and our council members, uh, please note that March 22nd is our next meeting, uh, followed by May 24th, July 26th, September 27th, and November 15th. And uh, we hope to see you all in person. Uh, we. I'm, I'm not even fingers crossed this year. We are having a field trip. Uh, we are going to a remote location or an off-site location uh, to have a meeting uh, to get, you know, get out and see you know, the work that we do is, is really best demonstrated by you being out in the field with us. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll plan that together and, and hope uh, our guests on the line can also uh, join us in those adventures. So. So that's, uh, that's upcoming for our council meetings. I did want to just look back a little bit. Uh, I'd like to give an update on you know, what has transpired since our last meeting. Of course, a lot of holidays and transitions in there. So um, in terms of DCNR news, we were able to roll out a you know, massive tranche of grants right towards the end of the Wolf administration, thanks to uh, money that Cindy mentioned that were, was the ARPA funding in the last budget or in this budget. So uh, our Bureau of Recreation and Conservation worked very hard to get a, an extraordinary in-between grant round, a sup what they called a supplemental grant round, uh, out the door to help, uh, you know, help, help commit those dollars as, as ARPA funds are needed to be committed uh, very quickly. Uh, so they uh, worked hard to get those out. And, and among those announcements was nearly $20 million to uh, underserved and distressed communities for their local recreation uh, and uh, conservation needs. So, so that was really exciting to be able to, because the ARPA funds didn't require as much of a match or very little match, uh, it really opened the door up for some of those communities who found it difficult in the past to uh, engage with our grant funding. So a lot of happy people there uh, in commu smaller communities, disadvantaged communities, they were able to put some parks uh, and uh, into their communities and boost those needs of the communities. Also included in that grant announcement were um, more than $3 million in trail improvement. Uh, that included um, uh, about $3 million for seven gra uh, trail pr projects specifically, and then uh, the remainder in ATV and snowmobile grants. Um, and I can see it's snowing here now. 
Um, so snowmobile um, <laughs> for Bob's um, uh, for Bob's interest. Um, yeah. So I did you know, some of that grant money to go to the statewide uh, snowmobile association uh, for, for support of them, uh, as well as uh, a trail a snowmobile ATV trail over Pine Creek. Uh, and then finally, uh, uh, close to twelve million dollars to support. Um, planting trees and meadows, riparian buffers uh, in and among the Commonwealth, uh, using, again, ARPA funding to do that. Uh, the, uh, this, the Keystone Tree Fund, which is fairly new to the agency, is a reminder that tree fund is very beneficial to us. It is a, a $3 check-off on the registration um, licensing that you do with PennDOT. There's a little box there. You can you can contribute $3 uh, just to automatically. Uh, and we get in, what, 100000 a month, I think, is what's coming. I, I forget. I might be saying the wrong number, so I'll, I'll fact check myself on that. Okay, maybe maybe I'd add it as zero. Maybe it's 25. Anyway, I'll get you that number, but it's a nice amount of money that's coming in to support uh, tree planting and riparian buffers. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, imagine uh, 20000 coming in each month uh, to support those efforts to add up for, for tree planting. So, very exciting news for those for that grant announcement, and uh, a new grant round has opened. Uh, so BRC never stops uh, their work, um, and uh, that grant round opened is our typical grant um, uh, to uh, uh, Chris Novak is adding in there. It is about $20,000, uh, so, um, and Matt just added another comment in there um, as well. So uh, the new grant round is opened, and that will close April 5th. I think with the exception of ATV snowmobile, which, which I think is March 31st. So um, I notice uh, Chris is on the line. I just want to put a little plug in for her work and her office. So they're focusing in this month on the conservation landscape program. I think it will be beneficial sometime in the near future to have a presentation on either a landscape or the program itself and some of the work that uh, they're doing. Some of our field trips in the past have really been in those landscapes and we've learned more about them. We've had uh, a talk. Uh, it has, has spoken with this group, uh, Ta Enos um, has spoken with this group, so uh, I think it would be good maybe to have a conservation landscape uh, presentation to this group. Uh, there's a new video that uh, our team put together, our communications team put together on the conservation landscape program, which is an interview uh, with the leaders of that program, so I think that's being posted today, and that might be good. I'll share that link around so you can watch that three-minute video, just gives you a good flavor of the work. Uh, and the, uh, that's so impactful for our communities. Uh, and speaking of impactful, uh, next month's theme, communication theme, uh, will be the outdoor recreation economy. Uh, and along with that, we'll be announcing nine regional meetings, that stakeholder meetings that uh, will be uh, conducted by Nathan Rigner and Recreation Engagement Coalition to gather insight and input from businesses and uh, organizations that are engaged in the outdoor recreation economy uh, and, and get their input on how the Commonwealth can help them and others who are engaged in the economy prosper. Uh, and uh, we'll, you know, just as a reminder, as Cindy put, I always, this is my soapbox, but what, what we'd like to say about this sector, the outdoor recreation sector, as, as opposed to some industries, um, you know, this not only improves the economy and can add jobs like other industries, but it has added value that other industries can't can't claim. Like, you know, we can, you know, the outdoor recreation economy improves our health. Uh, it, it improves our happiness. It improves our connectedness as people and communities, and it includes our so, it improves our social well-being. So, in addition to that economic benefit you get, you're also getting the health and social well-being benefits. Um, so it's an economy that we should support and we are supporting and we look forward to uh, working with the Shapiro administration to um, really uh, elevate that, that economy. So that's my final plug on that and with that I'll, I'll ask for any questions. It's a silent bunch today. Anybody <laughs> online want to say anything? Meredith? Gretchen, just a quick question. The meetings, the regional meetings you mentioned, will those be open to the public and something that we as council can attend? We'll make sure that you are invited to those. Um, it will, we'll be specifically outreaching to those uh, 
organizations and people uh, in businesses who are I've engaged in the outdoor recreation economy, but it's not going to be exclusive. You know, certainly, and, and we all know that that Bob and Silas and Marcus are actually on that coalition. We'll have um, you know coalition members leading and guiding those meetings, uh, but we have not set the locations and dates specifically yet. So that is coming. If that was the next question, uh, we'll make sure we we um, we. You get those and get invites to those, whatever is convenient to you. We tried to pick, you know, locations nine. You know, it's a big state. Uh, so there will be some travel for people, um, but uh, it, we're hoping that no more than like an hour to get to a specific meeting. Okay, thank you. And they will start sometime March on? Yeah, we're, we're looking. We were going to do the end of March and, and through mid-April, but there was a scheduling conflict. It looks like, um, you know, the second third and fourth weeks of April. Okay. Great. Any other questions? Okay. All right. Thank you, Gretchen. And now, uh, Eric or Nate, are you all yep. available? Okay. Is it Eric? Yeah, it's Eric. Can you hear me? Okay. Welcome, Eric. Yes, we can hear you. Thanks so much. And Eric will have our legislative report. Thanks. I'll be I'll be quick. Um, I'll just mention that we're you know we're gearing up for the legislative session. Um, and as Cindy mentioned, our confirmation meetings uh, they're in full swing with the Senate right now. I think we have <laughs> I think we have about five or six scheduled today um, with different senators. So we're looking forward to that. Um, I'll just also mention that our Senate budget hearing um, it's scheduled right now for March 21st at 9:30 a.m. That's our Senate budget hearing. Uh, we're still waiting on further information from the House. Uh, we don't have that yet, um, as everyone knows. So that, you know, hopefully we'll, you know, we'll get that end of February, mid-February, end of February. Um, that's really all I have right now. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'll, I'll take any questions. Any questions for Eric? Nope. Okay. All right. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Next is council business, and there's really just one item that I wanted to share, and that is our election, our annual election of officers will take place at our May meeting, um, and I will be stepping down as chair at the end of my term this May, so we will be forming in the near future a nominating committee um, that will look at putting forth a slate of officers for that May meeting. They'll be voted at that time, and then we'll take office officially at our July meeting. So um, I did want to just, I've talked to some council members are interested, and um, if anyone is interested in serving, we have our chair, our vice chair, and secretary positions that, would, that make up our officers. If anyone is interested or learning more about it, they can feel free to call me and I would be happy to chat with them. And then once we know who those people are, we'll move forward with identifying our nominating committee and seeing what we can get working between now and May. And we will have in our afternoon working session today, just I asked Gretchen to pull out our roles and responsibilities and duties of our officers and also as council members, because as Secretary Dunn said, uh, CONRAC has, has been a very valuable uh, help to the department and the time that council members spend is really critical and very much valued and appreciated, especially those traveling in. I know it's challenging and it's not just a few hours at the meeting, it's more than that, but um, we very much appreciate that and look forward to engaging council members in the future as we move forward with our officers as well. So, okay, with that, we are going to move on to our presentations. We have our two presentations today, and first with us is Rachel Reyna and John Schwartzer, and they're going to be discussing our private forest land um, stewardship program and the work that's being done with our service foresters and forest landowners. And I see you there. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you. Okay. Everybody else okay virtually? 
Yeah, it's good. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. And we may need to do another sound check whenever um, John is on gets on screen here. Um, so just uh, want to first say good morning to everyone. Uh, hope everyone's doing well and make sure you travel home safely. <laughs> uh, but we're super glad to be here. Uh, excited to talk with you all a little bit about uh, the work that we're doing on private forest land with private forest landowners and partners. Uh, just to kind of give you a little context, our um, <clears throat> woodland stewardship program is under the umbrella of rural and community forestry, uh, which is the section um, that uh, I'm chief of. And uh, we really work primarily on land that is not owned by the state, uh, which is a little bit unusual from um, a lot of what our colleagues are doing. So I'd love to tell people that we work on land we don't own with people we're not the boss of. And that takes a lot of folks to do that work, a lot of partners um, to uh, to really get that work done. So um, we're we also in addition to woodland stewardship, we house the watershed forestry program, which you heard um, secretary talk a little bit about uh, riparian forest buffers and meadows, and um, that is a work of our watershed forestry team. And we also have our tree vitalized team, which works in urban and suburban areas uh, and um, does uh, helps communities with not just tree planting, but uh, also just a holistic look at um, the the tree canopy in their areas. So, and those programs have really been growing over the last few years, which is really exciting. Uh, and we are actually at the end of this week about to have interviews for filling behind a, another woodland stewardship position. So we're very excited to have um, be filling that position as well. And that person will join John Schwartzer on our woodland stewardship team. So. With that, I'm going to introduce John. Um, he is a, a newer addition to our rural and community forestry group, and uh, he's been a great addition and been glad to have him. He's, he came to us from the Michaud Forest District where he was the service forester, so he has a lot of on the ground experience, and uh, it's just been great to have him. And I will hand it over to John, who's going to kind of take you through this. And then we'll have time for hopefully for some questions at the end. And um, so take it away, John. Just want to do a sound check. And can you see my slides? Yes, we can see and hear you. OK, and the notes are not showing, correct? No, they're not. <laughs> OK, wonderful. All right. Uh, thank you, Rachel. And thank you for the opportunity to present to you. Uh, as she said, we are presenting on the private forest land stewardship. And not advancing. OK, why do we work on private forest land? So 57 percent of Pennsylvania is forested and the benefits of forests are wide ranging and well documented. They are. Vital to our environment, economy and overall health and social well-being and healthy forests are key to climate change mitigation and resilience. Research shows that the 16.6 million acres of forests in the Commonwealth work on our behalf to protect the quality of our drinking water, provide habitat for wildlife, provide renewable wood products for our use, support jobs in forest products, recreation and related industries, sequester carbon, filter the air, generate oxygen and help alleviate pollution. They protect land and property from flooding by reducing stormwater. They strengthen our immune systems, lower blood pressure, boost mood and maintain focus and much, much more. Most of the forested land in Pennsylvania is under private ownership. What happens on the 11.5 million private acres affects all the benefits mentioned earlier. Our program works with landowners to create healthy forests for the public good. Private land forestry management can benefit or harm society as a whole, which is why public dollars are spent to foster the good stewardship of privately owned forest land. According to the Forest Service Forest Inventory and Analysis, 
annually, annually Pennsylvania is gaining uh, forests at a pretty good rate. If you were to put this into context, it would be like gaining two Hickory Run State Parks every year in forest cover from non-forest cover uses. However, we also are losing an area the size of the Pinchot and Wiser State Forest combined to non-forest uses. And statewide, Pennsylvania is cutting an area roughly the size of Roth Rock State Forest. If this was a county, it would be the 63rd largest county in Pennsylvania. This harvesting statistic refers to all harvesting, public and private, and this cutting may or may not be performed with long-term sustainability in mind. In the Woodland Stewardship Program, we promote forestry and the knowledge of forestry, uh, especially to, sorry, uh, to all of these different partners and, and audiences, but forest land, especially when sustainably managed, provides important benefits to society. Private forest land owners are key players in overall forest sustainability. The land may be privately owned, but the benefits flow out to everyone. The Woodland Stewardship Program seeks to promote the forestry and forestry knowledge. And the foundation of this program is education. To build on that foundation, we encourage the landowner to invest in a plan for the property. With a plan, the landowner can take informed actions. And then the capstone of forest stewardship is continuous good management and possible long-term conservation of the property for generations to come. The central office staff provide resources and guidance to field staff and work with outside partners for statewide woodland stewardship issues. We work particularly close with our service foresters in field offices who are the local representatives of the program and the Bureau as a whole. 34 service foresters work across the, across the state in every county. And just a taste of some of their accomplishments in 2022 alone, DCNR service foresters provided technical assistance to 1,352 landowners. They gave 264 presentations to provide forestry information to a total audience of about 14 uh, I'm sorry, 15,000 audience members. And there was a service forester present at 43 public events or fairs. The impacts of woodland stewardship go far beyond the property boundaries of the landowners we work with. More people practicing good forestry, the more benefits are provided to the rest of Pennsylvania. Some impacts are active trained landowners that add capacity, facilitate communication, and do good forestry. Support for local economies and robust markets for forest products and services. Improvement of forest ecosystem health and the services provided by those ecosystems. Development of empowered, active, and coordinated partnerships. Recognition and conservation of special places and resources. And finally, improved water quality throughout the Commonwealth. We can't do this work alone. Many groups and people are invested in this. It takes partners and collaboration to accomplish our task. Here's just a short list of some of the many partners. And most of the prominent partners have come together to form what is, we are calling the Woodland Stewardship Innovation Team. It's a renewed effort to create a more seamless partnership where we are all working together towards the common goals. And this Woodland Stewardship Innovation Team is a collaborative effort by industry, the Bureau, academia, and other groups. And before I close, I'd like to call attention to the Pennsylvania Private Forest Land Enhancement Pilot Program Pilot. Um, it is new state funding that has allowed DCNR Bureau of Forestry to develop a pilot program to provide streamlined cost share programs to increase forestry practice, increase forestry practices on private lands. This pilot complements existing programs without duplicating partner efforts. It aims to reach historically underserved landowners, and this should be online in the summer of 2023. This is just a pilot, and we're trialing it in the western half of the state with a short list of available practices, which include treatment for hemlock woolly adelgid, <clears throat> excuse me, herbicide treatment for invasive plant species, 
and herbicide treatment for competing plant species and forest stand improvement. We're very excited to get this going. And here is my contact information. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to entertain them. Are there any questions for Rachel or John? Meredith? Thank you, John and Rachel, for your presentation. I'm wondering if you can provide an example of a common hurdle that landowners face in managing their private forests and how DCNR's technical expertise is able to help them. There's so many hurdles that uh, picking just one is difficult. So a lot of times it's a lack of education and where they're getting their information from is typically not the greatest sources. And that's probably the, the easiest one for our service foresters to, to help them overcome, but we have to get service forester out to their property or in touch with them in some way. Thank you. This is uh, Matt Gobbler. Hey, I, John, I, I really appreciate the presentation and uh, saw some, some information there that really interests me. Um, the private forest land, and I'm, I don't, I was trying to jot it down real quick, enhancement program pilot. Um, yeah, that one. Yep. Forest land enhancement program pilot. Um, what, what is the status of the pilot program and is there uh, a view toward making that an expanded program or is there a uh, data collection effort going on in order to uh, uh, determine uh, what the next steps would be with that program. The current status is that we are looking for a third party to administer the financial aspects of it. Um, it's it's basically ready to roll. We're just waiting to get a, a grant um, for the distribution of funds. And yes, we would love to entertain expanding it to the rest of the state. However, it hasn't been piloted yet, so we want to hold off until we get some results. Thank you. Can, can you tell me where I could find more information about the streamlined application process that um, that is mentioned on the slide? We can send you. Yeah. We can send that to you, um, or you know. It's not a uh, secret or anything. If other folks are interested, we could send, uh, you know, the the draft wording that we have for the program. Happy to share that out. That, that's great. I think, um, and, and just uh, something I wanted to throw out there from, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I've been thinking about and talking about different tools that could be available at our disposal, both public sector and private sector, as far as improving some of the challenges on our landscape. And um, what you were talking about as far as um, putting some investment into the landscape with regard to invasive species and otherwise, I, I think that there's plenty of benefits there to be had. And I think that having the resources for that is a, is a huge, um, uh, you know, a huge benefit. Um, I also think it would be worth having a conversation about the carbon impacts of that investment on the landscape. Um, and, and some of the things that, that I think that um, we would all benefit from a better conversation about is um, how can we best target resources toward additionality as it relates to carbon? Because um, my concern is I think that there are a lot of programs out there that don't deliver on additionality. But I think when you go and do the hard work on the landscape to take the invasive species out, to allow for beneficial regeneration, you will see that the forest will then uh, become a carbon sink in a much more effective and efficient manner. And I think that that, that investment in the landscape is so important. So that program is something that, that I, I think that there would be a lot of interest in, and it's something that I'd certainly be interested in helping uh, to, to share information about, understanding that it is a, a pilot. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, trying to uh, get to the point where where that program may be able to expand in its availability. I, I'd certainly be interested in, in partnering with that. Uh, so that was number one. Can I do a second question? Sure, Can we not? go back, and I apologize for, for jumping on the slides here, but uh, uh, when we were talking about the, the various uh, uh, acres 
um, the, the various impacts on acres as far as how much is converted from non-forest to forest, how much is converted from forest to non-forest, and then the trimming. I, I just thought uh, those are, yeah, uh, this one this here. One? Yes, I think these are interesting statistics. The one thing that I would point out from the, the presentation of it, um, something that would concern me is, is that the first two data points on this slide speak to a change in use. Uh, yes. And I think that to a lay person that would look at this slide, they may then subconsciously associate treatment, harvest, and thinning with a change in use, thinking that there are three of the same type of data point on the same slide. So I just think that it's important to point out that what we're seeing here is, is that, yes, we have some, some areas of forest that are revert or non-forest that are reverting to forest, some areas that are being cleared. But then that third data point is not a related data point in as much as it's a change in use because absolutely the, the sustainable yeah, forestry that that is practiced in the state is is it with the intention of a forest being maintained and and remaining a forest so to to the extent that we can be um be careful in how we present a statistic like this to the general public and, and to lay people i think would be would be very helpful right i i fully agree yeah, it's a totally different animal it's it is not uh in any way turning it into a parking lot or a farm field it's forest being cut and returning to forest it's it's not a change at all well and 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 to, to be fair i understand that, that that what you had said in your presentation is is that not all of those acres may be that case and that's part of the 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 intent that, that your bureau has which which is which is so noble is the idea that we want to educate our private forest landowners on uh on the importance of 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 doing that forest management sustainably and, and, and there's a right and wrong way to do it. So, so that's, that's the important thing and, and, and something that we're fully on board with helping to spread the message of. So thanks so much. Uh, Thank one other comment I wanted to make to, um, to your thoughts, um, Matt is related to the forest carbon piece. I think that would be a great connection to make. And I'd love to talk about that for sure with you um, and, and some of the, the work that you guys are doing as well. Uh, but I also wanted to mention that uh, we, the position that I mentioned that we're starting interviews for on Friday actually has a forest carbon piece to it as well. So we'll have a person that is uh, able to, uh, you know, devote more brain power to uh, thinking about forest carbon, not just forest carbon too, but other ecosystem services that would be relevant there. So yeah, thanks for those comments. I think uh, Dave has his hand up, I think. Yes, Dave Trimpey. Yeah, um, so not so much a question as a comment, but in related to Matt's uh, comments there and also previously about roadblocks, as I talk to and hear from uh, consulting foresters around the state, one of the ones they point out quite often is municipal timber harvesting ordinances, which are often uh, have good intentions, but are very, very poorly uh, administered and written and often result in poor or no management of, of forest. But this particularly problem around uh, metropolitan areas where we see it the most, rural counties, not quite as much, but it is growing year to year. And uh, again, just kind of one of your, I think, roadblocks in, in getting good forest management on the ground. Thanks. So in answer to that, uh, we had a wonderful presentation from the Office of the Attorney General about the acre, um, I guess it's acre law, and uh, there should be a right to forestry in all municipalities. So there's there's some there's a way to to combat poor municipal ordinances through this process. You're right. There, there is such a thing, and it's been around for a long time. Unfortunately, it doesn't stop municipalities from implementing no. these things, no. <laughs> and and then you have to go to court to fight them. Uh, so it, you you are correct, but it's still a, a, a roadblock. This is Ellen Schultzberger. Uh, I don't know if folks had heard, but I met I'm the director of forestry and in the room, and I just wanted to add a little bit to the conversation and to your question, Meredith. So, you know, when we're working with forest landowners, there's obviously that that education aspect is just really understanding what I have, you know, what I need to do and who do I work with. Um, but going back to that pilot is and and some of what um, 
folks have already been talking about is there's not a lot of kind of startup funds to be able to um, do some of that good work that Matt was talking about, like being able to address invasives or really start what would be a longer term process in, in the silvicultural practices of managing the forest. And so what we're working on, you know, so there's NRCS funds and there's some different funds that that landowners can tap into. But this pilot program that we're working on is trying to really address that that funding need is is a lot of times you know when you have a larger scale landscape you know 40 acres it's hard to be able to afford some of that um, kind of prep work you need to to build that healthy forest to you know get it ready for that next treatment phase or or a harvest essentially and so this program will help landers landowners get to be able to do that and and really get us to a healthy forest is, is what our goals are. Um, but of course, we're going to pilot that and hopefully we'll be able to have a more consistent program that helps these landowners because we hear these things, but we often aren't able to say, well, okay, here's this, you know. So that's what we're working on is, is how can we address some of those pro problems that come up when we work with them. Great. Thank you. Matt? Thanks so much for this conversation. And at uh, risk of dragging it out. I, I just um, w wanted to say how excited I am to talk about this pilot program. Um, I recently got some feedback from a counterpart that I have in a neighboring state where um, they're trying to deal with how they, um, how they manage the fact that there are some, uh, some folks operating in the carbon credit space that have good intentions, but it's uh, unintentionally um, incentivizing non-management of lands. And so when you look at it and when you're looking at driving towards true additionality, the true difference in this is what, the, what a, a given program or a given investment enables versus uh, if nothing were done, uh, something like this where you go in and make the improvements on the ground, you combat the invasive species. This is where you get the true proven additionality, the true difference on the ground. A uh, program like this is exactly what we should be talking about. This is the good news story we need to be uh, talking about out there. Uh, and hold that up as an alternative to some of these other programs that seem to be an easy shortcut of let's uh, hook up some corporate money with a landowner and let's incentivize them to, and we'll, we'll call it delayed harvest, but what it really does is it, it, it incentivizes non-management and, and, and uh, in many cases can lead to a degradation of the landscape. So this is a great program I'd love to talk more about and, and love to put my support behind. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, we always, yeah. we always say that if... Uh, if you're not managing, if you're doing nothing, that's management. So I fully agree with everything you said. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, next on our agenda, we have DCNR's Next Gen Council. And uh, I believe Jean Lynch will be, is DCNR's Acting Director, DEI Coordinator. And uh, she's going to be joining us virtually. There she is. And then also joining us is Kat Platt. And Kat, if you want to come up to the chair here and just uh, by the microphone, we'll turn your microphone on. I think Jean's going to get things started, but so glad you could be with us today. Appreciate you coming out in this weather. <laughs> she came from Halifax, so <laughs> that's got some mountains there, but okay, Jean. Okay, uh, well, thanks for having me. Hello, everyone. And I'm Jean Lynch. I'm serving as DCNR's Acting Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Coordinator, and I also work for our Bureau of Recreation and Conservation, which runs um, our community grant programs that Gretchen was speaking about earlier in the session. And I want to just give you a, some background on our Next Gen Council um, to give you some context before I um, let Kat have the stage to share some ideas with you all about potential collaboration. So uh, one of the things that DCNR's DEI committee has done recently in 2022 is that we created a new advisory council called the Next Gen Council. And I, I think Emily Her Hendrickson introduced this to CONRAC um, last may, maybe May or June at a meeting, but uh, not sure. Um, I want to give you an update, and I think some of the CONRAC members 
may not have been in, in their positions at that time. So in 2022, we created, we, we recruited and assembled a new advisory council to help inform our work. And we asked them when we were put out the call for members that one of the requests that we would have was that they would help us make sure that all Pennsylvanians can connect to public lands, natural resources, and engage in recreation and conservation. So we were looking for members who would represent emerging ideas and would have a little bit of a younger uh, demographic than we often have in our other advisory councils. So this group of 20 individuals is a range of ages that includes teens and young adults, which is a demographic that we are often missing in our other advisory councils. So uh, benefit to them is to learn more about public lands, how DCNR operates, learn about careers in conservation, and have opportunities to collaborate with each other and with DCNR staff, and also, of course, to advocate for changes to benefit their communities and to benefit um, Pennsylvanians statewide. They began meeting last April, they meet quarterly, and then they work together on committees in between their quarterly meetings as well. They're a really extraordinary, committed group um, that's uh, interested particularly in um, sustainability topics and equity, and um, we're, we're just really happy to be working with them. And so now I'd like to introduce Kat Platt, who is a member of the Next Gen Council, and she's um, identified some interesting opportunities and will be interested to see uh, where they might go. So Kat, we'll turn it over to you. Hello. I'm speaking here today because the staff at DCNR put out the idea that Next Gen members could attend the Conrack meetings. And since then, I've attended three. I believe that some of the initiatives and issues that Conrad covers might be connect to one of the next gen committees. Our most active committees right now are the climate change committee, which I'm a part of, and there's also the equity committee. And another that we may develop is the storytelling committee. Um, when I went to the Conrad meeting, which discussed e-bikes, I began to think about how it might connect to the equity committee because it addresses the issue of older people and people unable to or have a hard time using a regular bike. That was just one example I thought of. But if any main topic of discussion happens to have some kind of connection to one of the committees, maybe that specific committee can go to a CONRAC meeting and see what CONRAC is doing to promote equity, combat climate change, or incorporate storytelling. And then on the other hand, if one of the next gen committees is working on a project that relates to a concern or issue of Conrack's current interest, then we could share with Conrack what we are doing. And to conclude, I believe that forming connections between the Next Gen Council and Conrack could hold many great opportunities for the future. Great, thank you. Um, I just have one question. On each of the committees, could you, could you share briefly like what each one is focusing on um, and how many members there might be, like with each committee? Um, I don't know what the equity, I'm not aware of what the equity committee is doing that well, but I am on the climate change yeah. committee, and we are currently working with reducing plastic waste and incorporating more um, water bottle filling stations, and they're also talking about, we're also trying to figure out having more vendors at state parks have composting stations. So more, it's just about reducing the use of single-use plastic and just switching to more sustainable options is what we're focusing on. Okay, great, great. Does anyone have any questions for Kat? Meredith? I don't have a question, Kat, but I wanted to thank you for coming and for coming to multiple of our meetings. It's great to have you here and representing the Next Gen Council. I think you're right. I think it's a great connection opportunity. I'm sure I speak for the other members that will be glad to keep in touch and welcome you at our meeting. Thank you. Hey, Kat. 
Uh, Marcus here from uh, Pittsburgh, council member as well. Um, really happy that you're here. I love seeing the next generation participate at a DCNR uh, function and event. Uh, my question is, how can we further support you uh, as an individual in a profession, uh, well, an individual with a profession in the outdoor industry? I'd love to be able to assist in any fashion. I was just looking on the site. It looks like there's a lot of cool opportunities around uh, career opportunities that you're exploring, but also ways to kind of collaborate on initiatives that you've spoken of this far. Uh, I'd be happy to do that as a advisory member to participate in that or also just as a professional. So is there a way I can plug in with you? Um, is there a way he could connect with you? Or? Yes, yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I think we can probably get that information back and forth and yeah. see. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, I'll, I'll just um, also say that um, we, Gretchen and Joanne and Kat and I have spoken about this a little bit. And so, you know, through, through those channels, we can help kind of, you know, strengthen or cement some links between the two groups. We can, we can kind of help that flow of information until something gets established. Um, and, and thank you, Marcus, for that offer. Yeah. Yeah, I think that would be great, Marcus. And if there's any other council members interested, I'd be happy to help too, if we could just find maybe some of those common themes and see where we might be able to support each other or help each other or just be sharing information, whatever it might be. I think there would be some great connections. We just have to find out more of how we connect. <laughs> so. Okay. And I Any will. Other... Go right ahead. I'll just add one thing: the question about the um, the other committees. Uh, the equity group right now is particularly interested in the idea of gear libraries. So that's that's something that they're exploring, um, making more equipment available to people who, you know, want to try equipment out before they actually make an investment in it. So that's just one of the ideas that they're that they're pursuing. I'm sure they'll come up with additional ideas, but I wanted to give you an example. I'm happy to chime in on that as well. Again, this is Marcus. I do that professionally. Uh, so I establish gear libraries at little to no cost for underrepresented people to participate uh, in recreational initiatives. So that could be camping to backpacking, the list goes on and on. Um, so either within the advisory committee or separately, I'm happy to uh, connect and assist uh, with idea generation, but also support if this is something they're looking to pilot. Okay, great. That sounds good. Yep. Gretchen? Um, sorry, I know I, I don't usually speak up during these meetings uh, except for my report, but I, I did want to mention, first of all, you know, thanks to Cat, I, I can't imagine, you know, myself, you know, being in high school and presenting uh, to, you know, a bunch of adults in an intimidating type of setting. So thank you for that. But I, 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 if you don't mind, Meredith, me making this observation is that Meredith was uh, in her younger days, uh, which wasn't too long ago, um, the other day. <laughs> was uh, a youth council member um, on a different council, but she was a youth council member, and now she is on DCNR's advisory council. So you can see there's there's pathways for people um, of, of your age, you know, getting engaged with the agency, staying engaged, and then, you know, like Meredith has, has joined us at this council. So, um, so I... Sorry, Meredith, put you on the spot there, but but you having that, you know, from an early age, right. um, being engaged with DCNR. I no, I made a mental note too. I thought curly hair. I I was you a long time ago, but I so I was a DCNR intern at one point as well. I think you are now, right? Or working upstairs? Um, I was. I did do an internship during the summer with uh, a student conservation association, okay. but I'm not an intern currently. Okay, but a similar pathway, and just to. To note to you personally that this will all culminate in great things for you in the future and just I commend your interest and just applaud you being here and taking a step to be involved. All right, any other questions or comments? Matt? I uh, just wanted to uh, commend you for, for the work you're doing on the Next Gen Council and um, 
uh, you had mentioned a few of the thoughts that, that your committee had come up with on the, on the climate change discussion. Uh, since you are here at DCNR, and, and DCNR, one of the things that's been neat for me as a council member is to explore all the different bureaus and offices and the, the different ways in which DCNR uh, approaches that mission statement, which we had the pleasure of having a deep dive into with the transition document. Um, and so uh, what I wanted to, to ask was, uh, in your committee, have you uh, had the opportunity to discuss um, land management and forest management uh, as it relates to, to climate change as, as any of the discussions that, that you've had? Um, we haven't specifically focused on that, but I'd, I'd be happy to in introduce those topics to them next uh, time. And I, I wanted to offer if, uh, and I don't know what the format of your, your committee meetings are, but if there be an opportunity, um, if you'd like to have some information presented, uh, I've worked with uh, a number of groups on pr providing some information as far as how our forests interact in that equation, and, and I'd be glad to, to volunteer myself to, to provide some of that information for you guys to, to chew on, and maybe you can up with better ideas than, than we've seen so far. So great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. That's great. So we've got Marcus and Matt and good things happening. So all right. Any other questions or comments for Kat or Okay. All right. Well thank you so much. We appreciate your time today and you coming to our previous meetings as well. Thank you for yep. have a great day. You too. And we have been joined by Silas. So good to see you. <laughs> Do you want to say a quick hello? Hi, everybody. Uh, sorry I was running late. It wasn't the weather. I've been upstairs squatting in, <laughs> in a conference room at DCNR doing a webinar for 65 uh, professionals that are in the basic economic development course. And this week I was talking about um, rethinking economic development around uh, quality of life and place and outdoor economy. So it was good. It was good. It was time well spent, but I was sorry to miss really most of <laughs> the Conrad's meeting, but I'm here. Yeah. You'll be here for the afternoon too. Yep. So great. Okay. Thanks. All right. We have on our agenda, our work group reports, and I um, am not asking anyone for a report. I just want to ask the chairs though if they have anything that they want to share that might have happened. Like I said earlier, a lot of our focus was in developing the transition document and I think all of us poured our energy into that. But are there any updates from any of our work groups that our chairs would like to share at this time? Okay, just wanted to double check that. All right, thank you. And moving along, our, this is time for our second public comment period and I'm not sure we have anyone I don't believe uh, signed up to say anything at this point is that correct Katrina that is correct okay okay great thank you all right and that brings us to the end of our meeting anyone else have any comments before we close Okay, we are going to be moving on to our working session, and I think we will start around noontime. Yeah, yeah we'll start a little earlier. Uh, lunch is here, and um, since we've ended earlier, uh, we'll see if we can get things rolling by 12 at the latest. And um, the focus of our working session is just going to be talking about priorities and roles of council members and officers um, as we look into this new year. All right, do we have a motion to adjourn? Thank you, Rocco. Second, Matt. All right, all those, anyone opposed, I should say. <laughs> all right, hearing none. Thank you so much, and thank you, too, for our virtual members. Glad you were able to join us, and hopefully you can join us for the afternoon session. Thanks. Bye.